And welcome to Breakfast with the Chiefs. Uh, this morning we are joined by one of our favorite returning speakers. Uh, but before I, uh, we start, I would like to remind everybody that uh, Breakfast with the Chiefs is not possible without the support of our sponsors. Uh, today, uh, supporting our event, the Canadian Foundation of Healthcare Improvement. I believe Graham was here. Um, and the Canadian Institute of uh, Health Information, there are a lot of them. Uh, I think I saw Kira Lieb. I don't know. Yes, I did. And uh, also uh, IBM, Phil, I think Phil was here. And uh, NRC Health, uh, uh, Karama is here, and as well PWC. Uh, and for those of you who are attending your first breakfast with the Chiefs, uh, there will be a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. Uh, just put your hand up and I will have a mic available. And uh, if you would uh, like, uh, we can get started and uh, welcome Leslie Thompson. absolutely delighted to be here today and to be here in Toronto and on the ground because I actually spend a great deal of time in the air. And uh, when I uh, stepped into the role as uh, Chief Executive of Accreditation Canada, one of my early mandates was to bring together Accreditation Canada and Accreditation Canada International to both independent, not-for-profit organizations, but have been working together on a variety of initiatives, but we identified early, the board did, that there was a path and a way forward that needed to leverage the strengths of both, and then figure out how we're going to position for the future in a way that we would be relevant, we would be uh, meeting the needs of clients and uh, governments and individuals around the world in these changing times. So I've been to 16 countries in the past 15 months and almost 45 cities and talked with hundreds and hundreds of people around the world listening and learning and that very much has shaped the way in which we are moving forward and what I'm happy to talk with you about today. But when you're in the air a lot, you get a lot of time actually to reflect. And I do spend a fair bit of time thinking about the why. Why are we doing all of this? Why and are we focused so much on the, the, um, the challenges ahead, but reminding ourselves of what really drives us. And for me, I often come back to one of this particular instance in my very early career, 1982, as a Queen's nursing student in Moose Factory, Ontario remote uh, location, and this was one of the first de de deliveries that I was ever part of. This young 15-year-old girl, she didn't speak a word of English. I certainly didn't speak anything in the Inuit language, and we had to figure out, I was petrified, she was petrified, and we had to figure out together how this experience was going to work in ways that uh, could make this the best possible, obviously, for her and outcome. And I always remember the power of communication, of the human touch, and that uh, experience of coming together, literally partnering with a patient for, uh, to, to help them through um, literally one of the most important events of her life. The reason also why I treasure this is something actually turned out well because that little blue cap says Leslie and she named her baby after me. And uh, it was quite, t quite touching. And so I think about the drive and that this, the, the involvement and engagement and the experience with patients has stayed with me my entire career. It's a big part of of uh, who I am and what I've, what I've uh, been able to, to do throughout the system over the years. Many of you know I spent seven years at Kingston General Hospital and these folks here, uh, the, the Patient Advisory Council at KGH started with an idea based on the fact that the hospital was in a great deal of trouble, 
we had huge safety issues, financial issues, many, many difficult challenges. And through the very early days of listening and learning about how do we move forward, uh, our board put a pretty bold stake in the ground and we decided that any decision in our organization where there's a material impact on the experience of patients, a patient would be at the table. And it was the partnering with patients that really helped transform the organization and to move the needle on patient safety and to uh, really fundamentally change the culture of care within the organization. And when I uh, came to uh, Accreditation Canada, I now have been able to travel and to listen and learn from patients in five different continents, uh, speaking through interpreters, and, uh, and listening and learning to their experiences, along with clinicians and policymakers in all of these jurisdictions, and hear their stories about what's working, and most importantly to me, what isn't working, and the pain points in terms of how, what's in the way of achieving safe, high quality care. With this process of listening and learning, we also adopted in the early days at uh, the strategy development at Accreditation Canada, what we did was we engaged with an incredible uh, group called VUCA Innovation, and we partnered on the using human-centered design to come up with where we were going to head for the future. And part of that is doing research and interviews, in which we did with 700 people from around the world, and included from those are many of the conversations, and I'm going to share with you some of the highlights of what we learned, because this is the platform from which we're changing, and then now, and then I'm going to share with you some very specific examples of what we're learning, what we're seeing on the ground of the changing face of standards, accreditation, quality, and safety around the world. So first off, accreditation has been really helpful in getting us to focus on critical quality processes, but it's a ton of work. And I love this quote. Sometimes it feels like the in-laws are coming, you spoof everything up, you clean everything up, you get ready, they leave, and you go, thank God they're gone. And the process of, of this is a repeatable kind of scenario that, uh, that people describe a lot, that holds a lot in the analysis of this. Here's another. To engage doctors in accreditation, they just roll their eyes and walk away because they think it's administrative crap, frankly. It's kind of a harsh view. But I'll tell you, the, the feeling that the standards and the accreditation systems are not clinically relevant is a message that we've had in terms of how the current processes are. Everybody's feeling overloaded. There's so many standards, regulations, new ways of working. Everyone's got a new chart to fill out in a new way. And the burden of reporting and trying to figure out and make sense of all the requirements is people I can see are really feeling that pain in uh, Canada as well as abroad. And because sometimes when governments get, uh, get uh, caught off, off guard, what comes are more rules, more regulations, and uh, nothing is consistent in the way in which they're doing it. And there's very, it's very challenging for people on the ground. And then with that scenario, accreditation can feel like one more thing. And the other question we get is, so how do these standards compare to those standards? How does it come together? How am I supposed to choose? How do I know which ones are the best ones? This is another kind of, we call it the inconvenient truth. And many conversations with organizations around the world, but in particular with leaders in Canada, of saying, how can you give us exemplary standing when you go and look on our website and the Kaihai data shows that we're not exemplary. The challenge of the quality improvement, I think part of where we've uh, headed, and I hear from people, is some of it we've lost some of the why. 
people are chasing the badge, they're chasing the outcome, but not necessarily taking the hold of making this part of the reality of, of how people work each and every day. It's a lot of issues and, uh, and, uh, and big messages here. This one was one of the uh, other more poignant ones for me around the it's no longer sufficient to focus only on providers, institutions, or individual episodes of care. In fact, it's dangerous. And most of our programs and systems have evolved over the years. There's many fantastic programs, but they've evolved in the individual silos. We are actually everywhere. We're in every part of the healthcare ecosystem with health and social services standards that go from remote rural nursing stations to, um, to large teaching hospitals, small uh, aboriginal communities, and, uh, and uh, prison, sy prison system in Canada, the military health system. We're everywhere. But still, it's reinforcing the silos because most of those are site-specific. So what we did is we took all that data from, the, from those interviews and we created the, what personas. And what these are are composites of the data and the, the stories that then live on in the organization so that you can continue to work with the humanity and the, of, and the human side of change to always remind ourselves of Mike, who, the patient, who says, remember, I'm the one that has the information that, that you need. And let's not forget that. Overall, when we distilled things down, there were six really big buckets that consistently uh, of themes that came up again and again of saying this is really at the heart of what we're calling the universal needs of what we heard um, and what we learned. People needing to better connect with each other, the importance of listening to all voices, the full interdisciplinary team, the patients and families and communities and leaders. Designing systems and solutions for people, not making it feel like an artificial exercise that's detached from reality. Boil things down to what matters. Help us focus on the right things. Get rid of the clutter. Help us zero in on things that really matter. How can we pay attention to what's important when we have thousands and thousands and thousands of criteria to meet in our organization? And most important, was this notion of linking data and activities and uh, the processes to outcomes. This is a resounding call for change because the disconnect between the processes and outcomes, it's not going to be an easy lineup, but it is absolutely part of where we're headed because this was one of the strongest calls to action. When we looked around the world, obviously, you've, many of you have seen the, the reports that exist around all the different forces of change, um, the demographics, economic and social uh, issues, technology. There are so many forces of change that the interesting thing is the healthcare system, which used to be very much, we'd think, in our own little bubble, is so much part of the overall social and economic fabric of, an organi of, a, of a country and a jurisdiction that you just can't separate out what's good for health from the context that it's in. And these forces of change, one of the things that uh, I've observed in my travels is that there's actually, they're very similar. I would find myself many times just thinking, if I just close my eyes and I'm in a, in a country somewhere and I could be transported right back to here at home in Toronto or elsewhere in Canada, and it's the same issues and the same challenges. There's far more in the world that unites us than divides us has been my biggest take away. So our board has made some very important choices. And as an organization, we have, uh, we've, we've put some stakes in the ground in terms of where we're changing, where we're headed, and why. The first is rather than thinking of Canada and international as two kind of separate ways of, of, of mindsets, we're adopting uh, very much a global approach. We're even taking the Canadian and international accreditation programs. They both have a variation on our program of Cumentum and uniting those as a Cumentum global program. The uh, linking processes and taking the focus from processes to outcomes. From focus from providers to patient pathways, from institutions to networks and systems, from a one-size-fits-all 
which has been very much our approach before, to really tailoring and understanding how do you translate this into what's going to be meaningful at the local context. And from a we know best to a co-design approach in terms of tackling what the, the, the tough issues are in various organizations and systems and jurisdictions around the world. But the other stake in the ground that we've put is this separation of standards from accreditation process. So what we've done is we've moved all the direct accreditation activity from uh, Canada and international, and we've moved that, and that's focused the focus of Accreditation Canada. We repurposed the, what, what used to be Accreditation Canada International, and that has been now renamed, repurposed as Health Standards Organization. HSO. HSO is really the engine of the development of the standards, and I'll share with you in terms of a whole new way of doing that. The standards, the design of the assessment programs, the activation services, but it's really the, uh, it's, it's the uh, engine of change and innovation that will then offer up and support the, uh, the delivery to, of programs and services to Accreditation Canada, as well as to other accreditation bodies around the world. This is an example of the, that we're going through a process of becoming a health standards organization. And this is a formal process that is with the Standards Council of Canada that actually, by upping the bar of the way we work it, it, and the way standards are developed, will actually allow for the formal designation of these to be uh, national standards of Canada. Right now, if you've got someone from PEI and you've got someone from Vancouver and a good cross-section of people, we say we've got national standards. This actually is a, a moving us to a designation of a lot more rigor, public transparency, accountability, in order to raise the bar on the quality of the standards that are at the underpinning of any assessment program. Any, you, you just can't have uh, a strong assessment program without the basis of, of the, these, uh, these standards. We're in the midst right now, we're launching 25 technical committees. Uh, eight of them are, are launched after going through a priority setting process. These are the ones that are in play now. Focus highly on the highly on the development of integrated health system, uh, integrated health services standards, uh, improving some of the ones that already exist. Um, primary health care is getting an update, but technology-enabled health is a may, is a very big one, as well as the focus on assessment methodologies. And every technical committee, people are recruited for standing committees for about five years, and these uh, have, are made up of 25% patients, 25% clinicians, policy and administrators and others that are required with expertise to advance that. And they, through this consensus process and with public co uh, consultation, uh, are setting the standards for uh, the future. We've been, we launched client and family centered care standards in 2016, which brought the criteria of doing with part patients and families. Uh, together as part of that uh, evaluation of every criteria that was launched in 2016 and it's being rolled out, uh, out as part of the Cumentum Global internationally and one of the other big steps that we've taken is introducing the notion of uh, the experience of patients as surveyors. So we've just uh, completed the first prototype of what that's going to look like, what that's going to feel like, and patients as surveyors will be part of the process and part of the future. The assessment methodologies, there'll be a much bigger range than there ever has been before, and this could include everything from spot kind of assessments to some parts attestation to having uh, assessments happening on a regular basis um, and with the submission and review of data and outcomes to drive the de assessment decision. All of that is being looked at and designed uh, with our technical committees now. We've wrapped all of this together as in the notion of people-powered health. And this is our, our kind of our framework, our way of working, of engaging uh, people for change down the future. 
sometimes when I've gone around the world, the, you know, the, what I've discovered is this notion of people-powered health and involving clients and families uh, in everything we do is sometimes people think, well, there's different cultural differences. It's not going to work somewhere. We're different. We're special. What I'm here to say is that every corner that I've traveled so far, um, there is a huge uh, appetite and uh, lots of great examples for uh, involving and engaging patients and, and unleashing their power and potential to improve the health of their communities as well as what's happening inside. This is a group in Oman of physicians and nurses where we spent a couple of hours talking about patient and family center care and they are so enthusiastic. They just completely blew me away. And one of the other trips that I've done uh, went actually with Doris uh, Grinspun as, uh, from RNAO. They've got a, an amazing program of the BPSO uh, Spot Best Practice Spotlight Organization. And I went and accompanied Doris in Columbia to learn about how they do their assessments and involve and, and use data to drive change. And uh, one of the really striking features of their program is the active involvement and engagement of clinicians, and uh, which is important forming our new ways of going forward, and we're working with RNAO and many other organizations, Health Standards Organi or the HQO and other standards, uh, people who are in the business of looking at standards and seeing how do we actually help pull some of these things together. The uh, far right uh, picture of the um, with working with First Nations Health Authority out west in Western Canada, the designing brand new ways of doing the assessments and how to involve and engage and build local capacity so that it fits with their local context. They didn't want our ready-made solutions. Uh, surprise in terms of, but they wanted to embrace the standards but move in a different way to uh, design programs and services that were going to fit their way of working in the future and we're in active co-design mode with them right now. In the Netherlands, they call uh, people and fam patient and family center care, they talk about co-makers. Uh, and this uh, gentleman, a patient that uh, met in the Netherlands at one of the hospitals, their patient and the engagement is very strong. They've got a very uh, deep uh, connections with their communities. Uh, communities very much in uh, building and supporting the, 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 the setting the bar for what they expect of their hospitals and their, their communities and really impressive. In fact, in Europe, it's been a real eye-opener around the extent of, of uh, in active engagement of patients. And one of the, the most incredible examples uh, that I'm going to share with you is a project we've been doing with the European Commission. So the European Commission uh, has a legal framework for across all 28 member states that's for cross-border health care. And cross-border healthcare is a legal framework that then set up, we were asked, and it's the first project of its kind in Europe, uh, in, from, done by the European Commission, to establish uh, what are called European reference networks for people with rare and complex diseases. And the advocacy from uh, the, the patient uh, organization for European uh, patient uh, advocacy organization for rare diseases, we partnered with them and with the healthcare association. And we uh, were asked by the European Commission to design the assessment program for what these uh, European uh, reference networks would be. One of the interesting things is they, they uh, decided right up front they wanted this framework for knowing that there was, they were going to meet certain standards and uh, these are to be virtual networks so that no matter where you would lived in Malta or in downtown Paris that you would have the access to specialized diagnostics and treatments through patient pathways. This was the meeting I attended in terms of the closing of the first cycle of, of the project, and uh, it's been a spectacular success. And one of the reasons, one of the phenomenal uh, uh, deep, deep engagement with clinicians and patients, and, the, uh, and this happened from the time of contract awarded to the establishment of the program where it required getting agreement from all 28 member states at the policymaker level, the clinicians of 14 European reference networks and patients, and it was completed in eight months. So this went, and the groundwork 
of the idea happened over a number of, uh, uh, over, over many years, but once it was established, and now these are up and running, you can look at these on their websites, and it is a remarkable, uh, um, it's remarkable to hear the patients, especially, and the clinicians who don't feel isolated, and, the, uh, and that the pathways across the member states being established uh, to support people with rare diseases. Some interesting insights and possibilities for Canada. Primary care in Lebanon. So when I went uh, into Lebanon, they've also, as a country, really using uh, accreditation and the co-design of, of a, a national accreditation program for their primary care. They co-design that with us and uh, help uh, move as part of their reform to ensure that the primary care system, which was under a lot of pressure with the influx of refugees and trying to uh, have that position very much within the context of their overall uh, health reform with very, very difficult financial uh, situations. The, they decided that, that standards and assessment programs were going to be their, their lever for change. And so when we went, they mandate all their primary care networks to have accreditation. That's the way doctors get paid. That's the way um, the networks get paid. And uh, now with an investment from the World Bank, what they're doing is they're tying funding in their primary care networks in the accredited sites to the uh, reporting of outcomes and demonstrating progress. And it's remarkable. I mean, these are, this is the neighborhood of one of the clinics that I visited. And I couldn't get over the innovation, the passion, the commitment, and the, the uh, drive that was, uh, was moving forward for, for uh, advancing. They couldn't have done it like the European Commission project without the policy levers and the leadership of government. There's a global kind of language and, and movement that's uh, out there uh, around what shift from the millennium, goal, millennium, millennium goals to now sustainable development goals. And what I love about this, and no matter any country you go to, they're, they're talking about this now. And Canada has major contributions to this, but it's a language that starts to knit together the focus on, on not just, it kind of reorients orients you, not just on the, the acute part of the system. And we're I'm reminded by this great slide from the CMA of, of a reminder of what makes us sick. And then you think about, well, where do we actually put most of our time, energy, and resources in healthcare? And it's in all the wrong places. And what the framework of sustainable development goals do, and when you actually are looking at how do you actually impact on the quality and uh, bringing quality health services to all, which is at the heart of our mission, that you've got to be focused focusing on more than hospitals. We've got a number of standards and development around, uh, do a lot with social services standards. Um, Quebec has really embraced this. In their health regions, all the social services and health are all together, and they're, uh, they're, they're moving and integrating and focusing on this in a very big way. Data. Uh, I'm often asked, how, are, uh, how does Canada do in comparison to everyone else when you're, uh, when you're around? I think this is a, one of many excellent reports by Kaihai using data from the Commonwealth Fund. And, uh, and you, you know the slides that show where Canada, where Canada performs. My point is, is that the, is the importance of data in the transforming the, the journey and the process. We've got some uh, projects underway working with uh, colleagues at Kaihai, as well as looking at uh, with uh, projects with ICHOM, which is focused very much on the um, use of clinical outcomes that cross borders, that uh, are focused on clinical conditions, and they actively involve patients and families and clinicians on key condition-based standards and taking the outcome data and actually looking at how do you infuse that into your assessment of what's going on and using that to drive change is a real frontier for the future. We do not have all of this figured out by any stretch, but what we are doing is on a, on a path and a journey fueled by 
the clients who are saying, uh, already signing up in some areas of saying, we want to test this out. What if you looked at the data that was posted by Kaihai as part of our initial assessment to decide on how we, uh, how we work? I met with four deputy ministers of Atlantic Canada last week, and this is an area where they want to, uh, they want to boldly go in terms of uh, trying to tie the two pieces together. Technology is going to be a very much a, a part of the, the future and how we work. And I'm, um, I'm you know, just to give you an example of how much is uh, how much is changing is that right now with this uh, we can do self assessments, um, all the processes of clinical tracers and self assessments in. Um, uh, for our using the standards and assessment methodologies will be done on your phone. And so we're testing and, and prototyping that right now with Shum in Quebec. And this is uh, where the dashboard, real-time data based on your self-assessment of a clinical process, a required organizational practice, um, the application of the standards for right from your governance functioning tool to your uh, clinical tracers for very specific areas that you want to zero in in your organization, that you can do it on your phone, have the results there, trending, it'll move to benchmarking, and this is the way that we are uh, not just moving down the road, but we're rapidly um, um, actually living and testing the, uh, the use of this new approach uh, within the organizations, and then it will be figuring out how do you bring in all the various data, all the various kind of points of assessment, even in organizations where you've got regulations, licensing, uh, standards, accreditation, input from various data all together um, to a single integrated face to then look at exactly where you're at. One of the other examples of just customizing tools and approaches for folks working, uh, just did a, an initiative with BC doctors. Uh, they wanted a work-life pulse survey that was specifically for physicians. They said, the one you've got just doesn't, doesn't work, but we want to understand where we are. So we tailored it, customized it. They've just uh, delivered it to 20,000 20, physicians completed the work-life pulse survey in BC. And that data then is being assessed and we're working on the how do you turn that into action plans for change. Another example of tailoring to local jurisdictions, figuring out what people need, delivering it in new and different ways to actually help uh, move, uh, move the improvement journey along. All of this kind of as I uh, wrap up is uh, it's all got to develop, it's all got to deliver what uh, we call shared value. Um, going forward, it's about creating value with and for patients, with and for clinicians, and with and for policymakers. And it's going to take pulling all of those parts together with, the, um, with all of our, our teams, our 700 surveyors around the world, and, uh, and uh, those who are deeply invested in, in um, achieving and demonstrating the best, uh, the best uh, standards that, uh, that they can for the health of their populations, their communities, and their, their patients. But shared value, you hear a lot about value-based care, value-based procurement, value-based everything. We've got, we're really focused on shared value and figuring out how do we actually bring that to life in a very concrete way. So all in all, there's, uh, when I kind of step back again, looking at the, uh, the lessons learned from around the world, again, my message is there's, you know, there's far more that unites us than divides us. I'm incredibly struck by the passion and the commitment of people to try and do the right thing, but also we've, we put so many roadblocks in people's way that must be moved. We are not going to, in our journey as Health Standards Organization and uh, Accreditation Canada, we're not going to be doing these, uh, these changes alone. Um, working with uh, organizations and various jurisdictions around the world, our surveyors, our staff, our, our teams, our uh, various organizations, uh, private sector partners, these are the, this is the only way that we will go forward, but there's a lot of energy and excitement about what's happening. And around 
around what, and some of the early uh, steps that are really proof of concept that we're on the right track. So this is uh, the team at home in, uh, in Ottawa, uh, where uh, really th with, we've uh, settled on uh, this bold ambition to unleash the power and potential of people around the world who share our passion for achieving quality health services for all. We have teams of people in different countries as well. We have offices in Belgium, in Ecuador, in Montreal, in Toronto, and here, and, um, or, and in, uh, and, uh, in Ottawa. And it's pulling all those folks together with the many partners that we have that are going to allow us to move forward. And to me, it all comes back to where I started in terms of the fuel for change, the meaning of why, uh, why move kind of hard and uh, far and fast to redesign and to transform the way in which standards and assessment programs are used and what to uh, try and position the role that they can play uh, going forward. To me, it's all about coming back to Mario, who's uh, one of our um, surveyors. We've got a patient, or he's, he's uh, being in training for uh, being a patient surveyor. He's a patient advisor. We have a patient partnership office that's open. We have three patients that have been hired to also work with us in addition to building the capacity to uh, support the change through the many partners we're bringing on board to uh, fuel the way forward. And to me, this is what it's all about. Thank you very much. So we now have a little bit of time for a Q&A, and if anybody has any questions, just raise your hand and I'll come over. Thank you, Leslie, and being a nurse, it's great to see that photo of you up front there and the care that you still exhibit uh, for this patient population. Uh, in relation to what you're doing, and then we see the emergence of the high reliability organizations yeah. and then the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, can you talk about how you're tying all this together, together given our incidents and adverse events? Terrific. Thank you, Pam. The uh, question in terms of tying all the parts together, there's a lot of players and there's a lot of work going on. Um, CFHI, CPSI, high reliability organizations, and, and many, many others. Our commitment is to be, uh, to really, to to power forward with partnerships. Um, we are working with all of those organizations and more to figure out if you actually take the persona of if you were an organization, what does it look and feel like by trying to work with all of us? And, uh, and understanding that and figuring out where do we help rationalize, where do we help uh, align. Right, there's a lot of great partnerships that have already existed going forward. CPSI and, and uh, Accreditation Canada, for, as, as examples, have worked together very, very closely in the past. We're taking that to a new level and we're, we're going to uh, be discovering what else can we do to help support so that people don't have to feel like they're making choices. Do I use this bond? Binder or this binder? Do I? Uh, how does this one fit with this? If I follow this path, is it going to be the same as if what, when you come and do a survey, have I chosen the right the right approach? Fact is that people need a variety of tools. There's no one size fits all, and we're not gonna we're not going to. Um, uh, and it doesn't need to be all all one offering. We heard loud and clear, even as the um, even with the patient safety. Culture survey, you know, Accreditation Canada used to say you used to have to, you had to use our tools. Um, we're not doing that anymore. There's ways that you can incorporate, and we're using our technology platforms as the way to be able to link uh, the use of tools from different ways into supporting the the uh, the work going forward, including uh, like one of the great patient safety culture survey tools that. People have been using, UHN's using it now, and a lot of organizations around the world is the AHRQ, um, Patient Safety Culture uh, Survey Tool. Well, we actually use that with all our international clients, but we haven't been using it in Canada. So that's an example where we're bringing together global learning, figuring out how you put it together, and being able to offer up the most value for, for people, and reducing duplication, Making it easier to do the right thing has been a very, very strong call to action, and we're responding to that. 
Uh, thank you, Leslie, and thank you for reminding people of uh, our uh, joint uh, visit in Colombia. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the issue of where health really um, hits the road, which is not healthcare. Yes. Um, so I wonder how many in this room know, for example, that today is the release of the largest report ever in Ontario about correctional facilities and where correctional facilities need to move. So first yep. apologies, because I'm leaving in yes. like five minutes to go to that press conference at Queen's Park. But I would dare to say that very few even know yep. that that's happening. So you saw a lot in countries that are less fortunate than ours, but you also see that in indigenous communities here. Yes. And uh, you mentioned that, and, and I really think that's a refreshing view, but that needs to move to action, right? Yes. So if here in this auditorium, right, breakfast with the chiefs, very important, this is the top leaders, or many of the top leaders, um, if likely not many know that this is happening today here in our own home, how do you plan to move, whether it is HQO that is doing a tremendous initiative on social determinants, or others. I, I wouldn't say RNO because actually we walk the talk mm -hmm. with social determinants. But how, how do you propose, if we know for a fact based on research, that actually what creates health, yeah. right, is equity of resources, access to resources. I'm talking even water, right? I'm talking income, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera whether it's for inmates, whether it's for people with addictions, with a safe injection, yeah. wh whatever. How do you, how do you, how, how, what would you propose to the leaders uh, of organizations? The, um, you know, that's, uh, one of the things that we're doing to make a contribution um, and uh, that will engage others is with the uh, with some of the new standards that we're developing. If I take the integrated health systems standards, um, public health, we've got public health standards. Um, they focus on these issues, and they put uh, the, the reason why standards standards have a very important role to play because they are based on saying this is what based on the evidence and the consensus of experts what should happen what should be in place. Um, and so having those well articulated, well expressed, making sure you've got the right people around the table, the right evidence being brought to bear, and putting that stake in the ground and saying this is the standard. And that's why we're raising the bar of this. We're not leaving it to informality. We're not leaving it to who was around the table that happened to know someone who knew someone. And then all of a sudden you have a standard that starts to reflect the table as opposed to the standards that actually reflect what they should be. And these issues are, we're using the sustainable development goals as part of, uh, part of the framework and thinking as, they, uh, as, uh, as we move forward, as well as from WHO, the People-Centered Integrated Health Services uh, thinking, which, which tap into especially of how you need to be connecting with communities, the transitions in care, and getting at some of these core issues that need to be in place in local jurisdictions and healthy communities. So no one thing is going to solve these doors, but I do think that where, uh, where we're moving to is, uh, well, there will always be a role for facility-based accreditation or standards and accreditation. The emphasis is on the pathway of the person and within this integrated system that brings the communities and the patient and the institutions together. And there will be stakes in the ground of what those standards need to be. And that's, we're not going to shy away from those. Um, they will, and we will, people will then be able to decide how they de progress toward the standards. But the standards will be there, they will be declared, there'll be national standards of Canada, and they will, uh, that's, that is a start. And making that um, a platform for change is, and a lever for change that people can, uh, we're, we're also gonna uh, really work on, but with our people-powered health, having conversations with the public. And uh, because 
Uh, I, I absolutely believe that the voice of patients and the public are going and citizens will be the, uh, the real driving force bef behind reform. We've been dragging our heels in the system for so long and we have so many examples of where we all know what the right thing to do is and we just aren't moving. And so this is, uh, this is part of, uh, or some examples of where we're, what we're going to do. And everyone, every leader needs to step up and focus on doing those right things and working together. And what I've learned from uh, jurisdictions like in Colombia and the corners of, of some of the countries I've been in is uh, like there is, there's no shortage of great ideas and innovation can happen in all circumstances and money does not solve the problems. Does not solve all problems. <laughs> does not solve the problem for healthcare. Yes. Yes, yes, fair enough. My name is uh, Andrew Williams. Hi, Andrew. Uh, I'm uh, a hospital, a CEO, and also a surveyor. So I, I raised some comments from a couple of perspectives. Uh, first, I want to just give a shout out to Accreditation Canada because I believe unequivocally that the care we provide uh, in our systems is better and it's safer as a result of the diligence of the accreditation process. And I think that's fundamentally important. So don't ever lose sight of the role you play in, in pushing the system to raise that bar. Thank uh, we, you. We need that, that, uh, that direction. Um, but a couple of granular observations. I, I, I really like uh, the direction that you're going. Uh, I think you can never excel if you don't renew, and you've got some really neat ideas. Uh, I think the current rating system that you have uh. with accreditation is a massive barrier to where you want to go. I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting as a team leader at a debrief and it's evident to me that the leadership team is focused exclusively on the rating and not on the processes yep. that they have as an organization. So that's a worry. And the second point is that, and I think this is a huge opportunity, uh, I would like to see accreditation focus more on governance. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, if you want leadership and you want change, it's got to start with your governance systems. And I don't think we provide enough attention to it, certainly in the, in the survey process and in any area uh, in, in general. So I think that's a huge opportunity. Thanks for both those comments. On the rating scales, there is, uh, they will change. As we move to uh, Cumentum Global, uh, there's process underway. There will be engagement and discussion. We've heard loud and clear, and we agree, the current rating systems in Canada are not uh, working and um, there needs to be some sorts of rating and how that's going to look going forward, I don't know exactly, but we are moving away from the, the current model. But also, um, and as I was talking with uh, a, a group, uh, the whole province of Nova Scotia is getting ready to undergo their accreditation and Alberta, the whole Alberta Health Services is this week. Um, what we're talking to leaders about in the meantime is saying it's up to you to set the tone in your organization. And we need more conversations with board chairs and CEOs about, they, they do set the tone. We don't tell you that that has to be the most important thing, but there is, uh, there's been a disproportionate emphasis on the prize, um, and that is, I think, really getting in the way of achieving the, the, right, the right things. On the governance side, there is a lot of work to do in there. Even when you look across Canada in the, uh, outside of Ontario, um, almost all the boards, but I'd say actually in Ontario as well with the Lynn boards that are now going to be delivering services, so we're under conversations. What does that mean to, to have... Uh, um, accreditation processes for for them as well and needing to, to figure out how that might work but when all the boards are appointed by government um, that is another whole dynamic uh, because most regional health authorities uh, and uh, regional entities are uh, people are government appointees so this is there's active conversation around how that changing landscape or how to d deal with that changing landscape as well as getting at the heart of what you've described the integrated health services standards, uh, the work that's uh, just recruiting the technical committees now, but that's focusing very much on leadership and governance as the focus for what needs to be in place for integrated health services. At the, they would be used at the jurisdictional level. 
so we're going to we're going to get there. Thank you for your comments and for your service, Andrew. Both you and Ron and others are are the lifeblood of uh, of um, Accreditation Canada, and we really uh, couldn't do any of this without you. So thank you. Hi, thanks, Leslie Mooring Quigley. <clears throat> uh, just can you help us to understand, in light of the changes you've made, what the organizational relationship is now between accreditation? and HSO. Uh, I'm, I'm having some difficulty in, in visualizing that. And also, in terms of level of effort, the balance between the Canadian and international work, given that you did previously have the two organizations, now have one, what does that mean in terms of emphasis? So first, in terms of an organizational model, they're both, um, they're both um, independent, not-for-profit uh, entities. Um, HSO is the, that's where the board is, and the, of uh, we have the the main board as the board of uh, health standards organization, and Accreditation Canada is a uh, uh, an affiliate organization to HSO. The uh, but we work as one. The board oversees all the uh, all the parts in the performance. And um, and uh, that's where how how we work. The and I'm the CEO of both uh, organizations. In terms of and then, but you have to meet for the Standards Council of Canada to be a recognized standards development organization. You actually have to have certain firewalls in place between your standards development work and your uh, and your uh, your accreditation processes. And we have all of those uh, all of those elements in place. In terms of the balance of work, the uh, you know, Canada is uh, is by far the the largest uh, set of clients that we have, and. And uh, our work is driven by that we're paid by clients. And so everything we do is from the organizations and governments and others that are making the choices to, uh, to use our services. And so that's where we're, we, we work. And then HSO is doing a lot of that development piece. And that feeds into offering up the products and services for Accreditation Canada, um, doing its work Canadian and internationally. And internationally, where we where accreditation, uh, the Canadian accreditation programs are used, we um, uh, some of them have Canadian surveyors going over. We also are training a lot of local surveyors to be able to do surveys in their own local jurisdictions. And the other piece is in different countries, like in Brazil and like in the Netherlands, they have their own accredit national accreditation bodies, like Accreditation Canada, but they license our Cumentum program and they deliver it on the ground in their areas. And we work with those, with those other uh, group. They all form a credit, uh, a, a global program council that oversees the governance of the Cumentum program. Hi, thanks for a lovely presentation. Uh, what I'm wondering is, particularly as you move towards more of a determinants of health focus, uh, a study we did on uh, accountability, which Accreditation Canada was one of our superb partners and helped okay. us. And one of the things we found was that there was a skewing as you started to try to get into, into measurement towards things that were easy to measure mm -hmm. and controllable. And there was a tendency to take out of the standards things that you couldn't control. So public health units didn't want to be held accountable for whether people smoked. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, just in, in general, that there could be some adverse consequences of too much of a, uh, an emphasis on measurement to leave out super important things that you either can't measure easily or you can't control. And are you seeing this as an issue as you move towards these new standards? This is one of the precise reasons why we've separated and created the, the, uh, the, this health standards organization. Because the standards need to be the standards. When you've got the standards being developed by whether or not I'm going to meet them, and I'm at the table and worried about that as opposed to what the standards are, you are going to leave some things out. And we have seen examples of that where we've been said your standards are too low on some areas and too 
noisy on, and complicated and cluttered on, on some others. And so by putting the stakes in the ground of the best evidence, the best, uh, the best uh, experts, uh, it, the, every technical committee also has international representation. I didn't mention that. Um, and they are the ones that need to come up with what is the standard. They are completely unencumbered by what does it mean for an assessment program is, a, is, the, is, the, the, is, is another step, but you don't design them for assessment. You say, here is the standard, and, uh, and then it, uh, it, works, uh, it, it works much better based on evidence of, of looking and talking with organizations like ISO and CSA and, and others that, that uh, their standards governing the um, excellence and, um, in other industries. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, as you're leaving for this morning, uh, our next Breakfast with the Chiefs is next week with Andre Picard talking about matters of life and death. Have a wonderful morning. Thank you.